we have the honor to have with us Mr. Kotari. I don't know if you hear us. Yes, yes. And we can hear you also. Uh, I will introduce the panel. So we have Mina Salami. Olivier Goudet, I'm sorry. A bit tired. Yvonne Goua, and the same founder of the Extinção Rebellion in Belgium, who also speaks Portuguese e que é, é, é de origem portuguesa, ou, sim, e então que, que vai também apresentar a parte ecológica das lutas. Com a escutaria vamos tentar ver quais são as, uh, simplesmente, as uh, combinações possíveis que podem existir. Uh, vamos, we are going to start with you, uh, a Xiscotari. I would like you uh, to introduce us with uh, maybe uh, the nature of your struggle, and uh, I would like you to introduce, yeah, to simply explain us what you do so that the Portuguese audience that is here gathered can uh, understand uh, what kind of struggle you're uh, fighting for today. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm sorry I am not uh, able to be with you physically. Uh, I decided to try and limit my international travels uh, as much as I can, so um, that's why I'm, I'm sitting at home and talking to you. Um, I am uh, Ashish Kothari. I work with an environmental action group called Kalpavriksh. It's a 40-year-old organization that we started when we were students. And uh, we have been struggling on issues of, uh, of development, which currently is extremely violent in many forms. It is violence uh, against nature, a lot of destruction of natural ecosystems and so on. It's also violence against uh, local communities whose lands are taken or whose rivers and forests and uh, natural resources are taken and they are uh, physically displaced. So uh, for the last 40 years, we have been doing uh, action research and also advocacy and support of local movements in various parts of India, trying to uh, resist this destructive development and also work towards radical systemic alternatives that people themselves are coming up with and then uh, try and put them together as a kind of a vision of what uh, India or the world could be uh, if people are able to take decisions based on their own priorities, cultures and uh, ecologies. So that's primarily what I've been doing in the last four decades. Uh, in, in what, what, what dimension does globalization has in your struggle and how do you manage to connect the individuals with whom you fight with a sense of globalness, in a sense, for their struggle? Or do you manage to bring them to activism through, local, uh, through localism or through an intersection between both uh, scale, scales? Well, uh, since 1991 in particular, when India joined the global economy in in many different ways. There was liberalization and much more opening up of the economy to, uh, to the global um, corporate sector. Um, communities have been facing the uh, impact, the negative impact of that much more in terms of mining and uh, hydroelectricity projects and, and so on and so forth. So one of the things we do is to try and work with communities who are resisting to try and explain also, what are the connections between what they are facing locally and what are the global economic powers or financial powers that are impacting them? Because that kind of knowledge or information is not available very easily to local people. Uh, so that helps to empower them uh, in terms of making the local to global connections. Uh, on the reverse side, of course, uh, this also means arguing for and supporting economic and political localization, the rights of self-determination, of autonomy, and so on. And then trying to see what are the, the positive global connections, for instance, with movements in different parts of the world or cultural exchanges that could strengthen. So in that sense, there is a deep connection with globalization, but in two contradictory ways. Olivier et Yvonne, vous nous avez parlé de la montagne d'or d'un projet contre lequel vous vous êtes battu parce qu'il proposait des bénéfices éco économiques locaux extrêmement faibles au regard du coût écologique. Est-ce que ça vous a amené à vous interroger sur 
le rapport de la Guyane à la mondialisation et la nécessité soit de recréer un espace euh, plus localisé en termes de production économique, soit au contraire de s'intégrer à des flux qui euh, aujourd'hui vous échappent partiellement du fait de l'appartenance à, à la France plutôt qu'à un espace économique euh, latino-américain. Un, deux, oui, donc euh, la question, en fait, euh, très rapidement, comme je le disais, le, le projet a été, au moment où on a été informé, presque deux ans après euh, sa on va dire, définition et validation par l'État. Donc en quelques mots, c'est un projet minier, voilà. enfin, si vous pouvez nous dire en oui. deux mots ce que c'est. Alors, Montagne d'Or, c'est un projet minier dans la forêt euh, guyanaise, qui est une, un bout quand même de l'Amazonie. Et euh, en fait, euh, en Guyane, il faut savoir qu'on ben, a 86 000 km² et qu'on euh, a à peine euh, allez, 20% qui est euh, développé. En fait, euh, tout le reste, c'est de la forêt vierge, de la forêt primaire. Et donc, du coup, euh, le, le projet, c'était de créer un, un énorme trou euh, dans la forêt guyanaise pour aller euh, chercher euh, de manière euh, méga industrielle l'or euh, dans nos sous-sols. Donc euh, avec euh, du coup euh, des tonnes d'explosions euh, par jour, euh, des camions, enfin du coup nous euh, aujourd'hui on a de l'exploitation orifère, c'est assez artisanal, c'est euh, en fait euh, à base, euh, on a une seule multinationale qui euh, le fait à base d'eau, euh, voilà, c'est pas, pas de, de la méga industrie et des explosions encore moins. Donc euh, tout de suite on s'est inquiété de, 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 de ce que ça pouvait provoquer dans notre forêt provoqué sur la civilisation, parce qu'en plus, on a découvert que c'était sur un site amérindien. Et, euh, et donc, euh, voilà, l'opposition au projet s'est avérée assez rapidement euh, générale, euh, mais il a fallu qu'on explique à la population, parce que, en fait, l'opposition qui était faite, effectivement, donc euh, en Guyane, on a, on a le droit de se taire et de subir, et de ne rien dire par rapport aux propositions de, de la France, et, et, et c'était de dire, il faut développer, 2017, il y a eu un mouvement, euh, un mouvement où les, les Guyanais ont demandé à l'État de s'investir et de prendre en main le, le développement du territoire. Donc voilà, vous avez le projet Montagne d'Or, et euh, donc ça va créer 750 emplois, misérables. Euh, ça va vous donner euh, à peu près euh, 1 milliard de revenus euh, de taxes par an, euh, et ça va fonctionner pendant 12 ans. Donc, voilà. donc derrière, quand on a vu ce projet arriver, nous en tout cas, euh, très rapidement, le combat international contre ce projet s'est avéré euh, indispensable. Donc euh, on a euh, intégré, euh, nous, les 500 fortes en violence, malgré notre capacité à nous battre tout seuls, hors de question. Je ne sais pas si vous avez connu aussi en métropole, qui est en fait, euh, hors de question, un, un mouvement avec 22 associations euh, guyanaises, mais surtout une centaine d'associations euh, euh, écologiques ONG qui lutte justement contre ce type de projet. Donc on a commencé par ça, et puis aussi sortir, sortir notre combat, qu'il ne soit pas que local, aussi à l'extérieur, informer de ce que le gouvernement français était capable de faire sur un territoire français, soi-disant où c'est important d'être écologiquement propre. Ashish Kotari, I would like to ask you a question. Um, how do you... Do you see the um, intertwining of your struggle with organizations like Extinction Rebellion and other big ecological agencies? And I would like to extend the question maybe to a more conce conceptual level, which would be, do you think the solution passes through a globalized con uh, protests and globalized movements against the effects of globalization or uh, through a relocalization of politics and the reduction of the in, uh, intertwinement and, and commercial inter, uh, exchanges between these very different zones. Do you, and do you think there must be a choice that should be made in, the, in that regard? I think we need, uh, we need a combination of both. Um, I think that the, uh, the crucial signals need to come from the local struggles, because that is what is meaningful to people. Uh, on the ground, and uh, it is about being able to then take those signals up to global levels. When we mean global, um, I'm talking about not necessarily London and Paris and Washington and so on, but where there are global forums of decision making and to be able to resist at those forums. Uh, 
such as what has been happening since the Seattle and other protests. So, um, but I think that uh, this com this combination of the local to the global has to uh, has to respect the uh, rights of self determination, including how to take part in the resistance of the local communities, indigenous peoples, local communities everywhere on earth. Uh, it cannot be a centralized, uniform kind of a, a resistance. Uh, so that's, I think, one very important part. The second very crucial part is that we have been arguing that uh, even in terms of the solutions, that when you have resistance movements like Climate uh, Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future and so on, or Occupy, etc., uh, they also need to have a vision or a pluriversity of visions of what an alternative society could look like. It's not enough just to say no to something. It's also very crucial that we are saying, okay, what is it that we are uh, wanting our societies to look like? And that also is emerging a lot from the grassroots, from local communities, from indigenous peoples and so on, or from local urban communities. This is again this combination of uh, resistance and reconstruction, or resistance and alternative part of the global that is important. Um, if by saying global you meant a centralized kind of a process or a homogeneous process across the world, then that is, I think, in contradiction to a process of localization, relocalization, or the assertion of local direct democracy or um, local economic democracy. Guilherme Sirobi, você participou na criação de uma parte da Extinção Revolução em um território particular, na Bélgica. Como é que vê a combinação da sua luta? Uh, com as lutas que podem levar a cabo pessoas que vivem em sociedades que são muito diferentes dos cidadãos que mobilizam-se em movimentos como Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion é maioritariamente uh, gente da cidade, que são os jovens urbanizados uh, que têm um nível de vida em geral relativamente elevado e que não estão confrontados diretamente às consequências ecológicas uh, do, da, da mundialização. Então, primeiro, como é que como é que se consegue mobilizar essa parte da população que não parece ser a vítima direta uh, dessas práticas e como é que se, e, e, e é possível complementar-se com as lutas indígenas, coordenar-se e não somente tomar talvez o um lugar que pode ser uma tentação porque uh, vocês têm o privilégio de viver cerca, perto de os lugares de poder basicamente tem, tem, então tem essa capacidade de pesar sobre homens políticos, sobre decidores de, decidir, de pessoas responsáveis económicos, em, também porque parecem, de uma certa maneira, a eles, em termos de aparência, na sua forma de pensar. E então, como é que utilizam esse poder, esse privilégio potencial, para, sem substituir -se as lutas locais, uh, apoiá-las e permitir uma evolução e uma conscientização uh, ecológica? Eu vou perguntar isso. Alô? Alô. Então, muito, muito boas perguntas. Um, só uma primeira nota para dizer que eu sou ativista no Extinction Rebellion, portanto não falo pelo Extinction Rebellion, é um, é um movimento que emergiu por todos os lados, emergiu também em Bruxelas uh, e aí o criámos, e aí o definimos conjuntamente e aí criámos as plataformas para pensar uh, e para agir uh, com base nas sugestões dos métodos uh, que vieram de outros movimentos. Hum, portanto, para mim uh, há aqui essa é uma pergunta muito válida e eu ouvi nas tuas questões é isto ou aquilo e uma das coisas que falamos muito é que é sempre há uma, há uma procura de uma convergência de lutas grandes de isto e aquilo e aquilo e aquilo outro o Extinction Rebellion fala de facto para uma população jovem e urbana muito privilegiada que tem o privilégio de se poder sentar e fazer desobediência civil e ter uh, atenção mediática e não ter as repercussões que outros grupos menos privilegiados, se fizessem as mesmas coisas, teriam. Portanto, nós estamos, temos noção desse privilégio e é, é a ideia de o utilizar. O Extinction Rebellion também não é um também não é um lugar onde aparecemos com soluções. Portanto, não é não é uma classe privilegiada que vem e que diz queremos que isto seja feito assim. É mais do que um sítio que propõe soluções, é um sítio que propõe espaços por onde essas soluções possam emergir. E daí pedir assembleias cidadãs 
com tiragens à sorte, com democracias aprofundadas, nos países, nas regiões, onde quer que o poder político a quem falamos, de facto, se disponha a organizar, para que as pessoas possam decidir conjuntamente como é que fazem face a uma ameaça tão extrema e tão vital como o problema ecológico. Uma dos... Um, um dos uma das grandes, das grandes vantagens de falar da ecologia, para mim, em termos de convergência de luta, é que a, a emergência, a urgência de fazer face ao, ao problema climático é um, um, um acelerador, pode ser um acelerador enorme em todas as outras lutas. Porque, na verdade, uma, soluções realmente ecológicas são soluções muito longe do sistema onde estamos hoje em dia muito, muito longe, com cadeias de produção muito, muito menores, a sairmos rapidamente de um sistema de crescimento constante. Isto, pronto, isto só é, estou a partilhar o que tenho vivido dentro da plataforma que é o Extinction Rebellion, não é a posição do Extinction Rebellion porque não há uma, mas não vejo um antagonismo. Eu, ouvimos muitas vezes, falamos muito com os Gilets Jones, quer em França, quer em, em, na Bélgica, tentar trabalhar com eles, já houve algumas ações conjuntas. Temos noção dos privilégios. Não é um O, é um I. E eu acho mesmo que... Ok, há um, há outro, há um ponto importante aqui. O Extinction Rebellion é uma plataforma importante para meter essas pessoas com privilégios que não têm acesso às violências que o sistema de que eles beneficiam obriga todos os dias, não é só quando chegam imigrantes às praias ou quando morrem no Mediterrâneo, é todos os dias do outro lado do mundo, porque só assim é que temos os materiais para os nossos telefones e para os nossos computadores. É uma plataforma super importante para que as pessoas entrem e entrem num ciclo de pensar, de desconstruir e de radicalizar em direção à raiz do problema. E a questão que eu queria pedir é um I, que é um I paralelo ou um I em conjunto? No sentido é que pensam que devem avançar em paralelo a, 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 pela mesma direção ou pensam que devem criar uma conexão com esses movimentos locais e diz, acham que podem funcionar de maneira independente porque talvez é a melhor forma sem um entrar na luta do outro, ou ao contrário, acham que o objetivo é criar uma convergência mesmo estrutural, no sentido em que uma interpenetração entre esses diferentes espaços. Então, o Exchange Rebellion não tem posição nisso, não é? é uma plataforma de muita experimentação, por isso a ideia é que em cada território, de acordo com as pessoas que fazem parte de uns movimentos e dos outros, do Extinction Rebellion, essa permeabilidade seja possível, desejável, que haja menos ou mais repressão, que estando pessoas urbanas mais privilegiadas no meio de grupos menos privilegiados consiga refriar a ação policial, que possam haver convergências de luta violenta, não violenta, tudo isso vai definir localmente, eu acho. A luta global, a força que o Extinction Rebellion tem globalmente é trabalhar em open source, por isso a imagem, o símbolo está lá, o que eles querem dizer já está lá, por isso se quiseres ativar-te a nível local é muito rápido, podes pegar nisso, mas depois a definição da tua luta é feita por ti e pelas pessoas com quem lutas e na definição de contra que lutas. Mina Salami, I, I would like to ask you about this, maybe because <coughs> of course, the idea of intersection is at the core of, of your thinking. And I fear that on uh, ecological issues, because this is what we have been talking about for now, it doesn't mean that we should reduce our, our questioning about this specific issue, but it is as if we had a youth urban... Um, I, I don't like to use privilege necessarily, but uh, uh, yeah, a youth urban population that is starting to have a metaphysical fear regarding ecology. And we have, at the same time, part of the world population which is physically feeling the consequences of this ecological change. So we have from one side uh, a psychical feeling, mainly. Not, of course, there are a few effects, but mainly it's, it's about a question of projection, of not fantasy, but... Uh, yeah, feelings, fear, etc. And on the other hand, we have people who don't have today the capacity to express their feelings, but are suffering the actual effects of, of, this, uh, of this situation. I don't know if you have reflected on this, uh, not paradox, but combination of phenomena that 
makes the ecological struggle something yet to be unified, if it can be unified and if it should be unified. Thank you. Um, I've definitely reflected on that. I've done quite a bit of work with um, an organization called Friends of the Earth. Um, and I'm a big advocate of ecofeminism because the structures of oppression um, of both women and of nature and of indigenous people around the world are all very similar. So I absolutely do think that we need to look at these issues, as you said, with an intersectional framing, if you like. Um, I think your question lends to some, something that I think about a lot, which is this combination of, of sort of juxtaposing terms, local and global, and how in terms of resistance and the things that I am resisting and the group of black feminists and feminists generally that I belong to and what we are resisting, I, 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 I see value in, in that terminology, but actually what is more important to me is um, vocal and voice, voicelessness. And by voicelessness, I don't mean um, just those who cannot speak, as you refer to the people who are being impacted by, by climate change, but also um, that which cannot be said. So that which is silenced and that which is unspoken. And I think that, the, that what brings all of us who are here together and the movement that I belong to, um, what really connects us or separates us is um, whether or not we are, we are speaking about, um, if we're giving voice to topics that are considered taboo, um, so if we're being vocal or if we are encouraging a kind of silencing of issues. And um, I mean, as a background to, to why I think this way, I, I grew up in, in Nigeria, which is the world's largest black nation, um, and where historically, even though by no means um, were women in what is now Nigeria um, equal to men, it was a patriarchal society, but women were valued. Um, we were not housewives, so I come from a lineage of women who who were chiefs of the marketplace, who were seen as shamans and diviners and so on. And yet, as I was growing up, um, I was taught that women, that Africa, um, I was taught to believe in the superiority of whiteness and of maleness. Um, I believed in, a, in an omnipresent white male God. Um, in the school that I went to, I was taught um, among many things, but you know, I was taught that white male explorers had discovered natural resources like the River Niger, which has sustained my country for, for centuries. Um, I was taught that girls should be nice even when boys were being mean because they were just being boys. Um, I was taught that it was a natural order for, for men to be in head positions, so to be the heads of the government, the heads of corporations, the heads of the family. And so this was this kind of local education that I was receiving. Um, when I was a teenager, we had a, a military coup, partly because of these historical factors. And so my mother and I moved to, to Sweden, to a small town called Malmö in Sweden. Um, we moved there temporarily, but I ended up living there for over a decade. And there, this sort of um, indoctrination and miseducation continued. So I was, I was taught with varying degrees of subtlety that Africans were inferior and primitive. And I was often um, bullied in my school, sometimes physically because of my skin color. Uh, to, to round up, I eventually, um, I moved to Spain, I lived in New York, and I now live in London. And in all of these places, um, it's been the same kind of education to, to speak about these experiences, um, about sexism, about racism, about the way that I see these issues connected to the natural world, to capitalism, and, and this incessant need for growth and greed. Um, resulted in my being referred to as somebody who was militant. And so I complied for a long time. I complied with all of this socialization that I had received in my life until 
a series of events uh, led me to start questioning things. And I first of all questioned the, the God authority. Um, so I had been uh, a, a Christian until my 20s. And then when I questioned the God authority, it was like one of those, um, the Russian, the matryoshka dolls. So I removed the God authority, and then I removed the male authority, and then the white authority, and so on and so forth. And it was in this process, um, which has led me to, to, to the work I do today um, as part of the global feminist movement, that I, I realized that really what it is about is this idea of who is vocal and who is kind of complicit. Um, and I think that we really need to bring that into our conversations because it doesn't matter uh, where we are you know, in the world, whether we, we live in a big city or in a small community, um, it is about what we're being complicit with and how many silences we're, we're willing to break. You're, you're not, I'm, I'm afraid in, in some ways of the, um, I'm, it's not that I'm afraid, I wonder about how you fight for a cause that can be at the same time an abstraction and a very concrete uh, uh, triggering of events uh, and so forth. And I wonder about if those who are able to speak about the causes as abstractions are often those who are the most protected from the actual consequences of those events, whether it is on ecology, whether it is on feminism. The, the right to speak is uh, very often given to, to the most protected uh, regarding those phenomena. And uh, I, I, I know that intersectionality is a way to, to, uh, to address those issues, but maybe you could tell us about this experience and, and if you have lived through it, if you, in, in the... In, in your fighting, you have been confronted to phenomena as such, and if, if you have simply thought about it in any way? Um, I think, first of all, I, I, I try to stay away from any kind of binary thinking. Um, so I think what the world, what our struggles, our resistance movement needs at the moment, whichever type of resistance we are engaged in, is to really start to think of things in a more holistic way and so abstract versus concrete don't really exist for me because there's a constant interplay um, between these things so people who are um, who are you know uh, climate refugees they also need the abstractions the conceptualizations and of course uh, if you're somebody who doesn't know if you're gonna be able to eat uh, breakfast or dinner, you can't sit and theorize um, by your computer all day long. Um, but I don't think that such people don't also need to engage with ideas in the same way that those of us who do sit by our computers way too long every day, like myself, um, you know, we also have to deal with concrete issues. Um, my family is spread around the world, um, this is, it's not because of climate change per se, um, but it certainly is because of a neo-colonial structure. Um, as far as gender goes, um, the, the, the British writer Virginia Woolf once said that as a woman, I have no country. And it's, a, it's an expression that I, I, I've taken to heart, um, which is why when I started my blog, which is called Ms. Afropolitan, um, Ms. is the label that a woman uses when she doesn't uh, give away her marital status. And Afropolitan is to signify, I would say, a kind of awareness, a presence in what it means to be African and all of the, the very concrete issues that we of African heritage face. Um, and then combining that with the, with the concept of cosmopolitanism, um, which goes back to what Virginia Woolf said, and which is why I advocate that, because I don't feel that the, the, these ideas of local and global and the nation state, um, they've never protected me as a black woman, and I know that they don't protect uh, so many women of color around the world. In English, if you want to hear, or, 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 or. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah. In English is okay. Okay. So okay. So the the concept of abstraction and impact, that is very true. The people that are that have more space to abstract, they're normally more sheltered from the impact. But then again, they are inside of a system that shelters them, and so that that space to go into deconstruction is really important. I mean, it's really necessary, else you don't pose the questions that will allow you to question the system you're in, and you will never be able to even open the door to imagine new worlds. And so, uh, again, I don't think it's a either or, it's also an and. So you, you need to create those spaces of discussion and of direct action and of engagement and of experimentation within Western cities which right now are very sheltered, but the people that are part of Extinction Rebellion, for instance, they're very aware that you're not going to be sheltered for so long. If there's a, a, an asteroid coming to the Earth, you can abstract of, oh, it's going to hurt in 10 years, but you, know, you, you act on it. It's this idea of climate, climate and ecological collapse is very, very real in, as a mechanism to make you move. Ashish Kotari, how do you manage to create those shelters in your work in the sense of allowing people to, to have space to conceptualize and not only to protect them factually from the ecological consequences of this or, or that event? Uh, do you manage to, to link both actions and allow them to finally create a form of uh, autonomy in terms of thinking and of political elaboration? I think what's very important is uh, is to have very robust and uh, mutually respectful networking of the various uh, movements, civil society organizations, individuals, and so on. Uh, that kind of networking at a national and a global scale uh, enables very local, uh, very meaningful action to be taken without or well, the fear of re retaliation by the system, by corporations and the state is, of course, always there. Uh, but there is a, at least some amount of security in knowing that there's another 100 organizations or movements around the world that will stand up with you. Um, so this is one very important thing uh, which we try and do. The second is that there are a number of platforms for instance, we have a we uh, coordinate a platform called the Alternatives Confluence, which enables these movements to come together and do the conceptualization visioning that's emerging from the ground up. So it's not something that's uh, an abstraction from above, which is imposed on these on people, but it's uh, emerging from the ecological movements on the ground, from the land rights movements, from the local feminist movements, from anti-casteism movements also, and so on. And uh, the attempt is to try and see, okay, what, what are the common elements that are emerging in a conceptual way uh, from these different movements? So just to give you an example, uh, the idea of, of uh, self-determination and autonomy in a culturally diverse situation or an ecologically diverse situation is, uh, is something that seems to be common thread amongst all these different movements or the idea of, uh, of the commons, as you know, which is a movement around the world, is also something that emerges from movements of trying to recommonize private spaces or to uh, fight against uh, intellectual property rights and so on. So it is uh, it's through this kind of providing or enabling platform that people who are directly physically impacted by uh, development and climate crisis and so on uh, or by patriarchy and, and casteism, uh, are, are enabled to be able to voice, to exchange experiences, learn from each other, and to voice, bring their voices onto different platforms and do a joint dreaming and visioning um, of what an alternative society that they would want. Olivier, Yvonne, I would like to ask you a question similar, because if... Si je ne me trompe pas, il n'y a même pas d'université en Guyane. Oui, il y en a une. Ah, il y en a une. Il y en a une qui a été construite quand qui était, euh... Euh, En fait, euh, en 2008, on a demandé euh, l'université de plein exercice. En fait, euh, en euh, 2012-2013, on a demandé euh, à ce que 
l'université devienne une université de plein exercice, euh, qu'on puisse nous décider par nous-mêmes, parce qu'on était rattaché à la Martinique et la Guadeloupe. Et là encore, c'était euh, un, un dur euh, combat. À savoir qu'aujourd'hui, à la tête de l'université, nous avons un compatriote, mais qui lui-même, aujourd'hui, met à mal euh, l'éducation en Guyane. Et ben, je ne voulais pas le dire, mais effectivement, est, est à la botte de l'État. Et comme on, on dit souvent, nous avons donc euh, nos dirigeants, nos responsables qui sont euh, malheureusement euh, à la botte de, de l'État français. Et au-delà, du coup, la question qui se pose, c'est celle des, des moyens d'émancipation à, à travers le fait d'accompagner les militants, mais aussi les jeunes guyanais en général, pour avoir des espaces où ils puissent élaborer des formes de pensée qui ne soient pas issues des structures coloniales que l'État impose en Guyane et qui leur permettent de se ressaisir de leur propre histoire et d'élaborer en eux-mêmes, non seulement des luttes factuelles, mais des cadres qui permettent de, de faire que ces luttes débouchent sur des, sur des nouveaux modèles de société. En fait, c'est ça. C'est parce que quand je parlais tout à l'heure de l'autonomie, rechercher, de pouvoir faire des lois locales. Ce n'est pas pour s'extraire du monde, en fait, mais c'est surtout pour que euh, ben, euh, le calendrier scolaire, tout simplement, soit en adéquation avec nos températures. C'est-à-dire que, voilà. pour l'instant, vous suivez le calendrier scolaire <rire> oui, de, de la, la métropole. France. Voilà, tout à fait. Et euh, aujourd'hui, les mois les plus chauds, c'est septembre-octobre en Guyane. Et les gamins sont obligés d'aller à l'école en septembre-octobre et de subir du 40-50 degrés dans les classes ou qui ne sont pas climatisés, qui ne sont pas euh, ventilés comme il se doit. Donc c'est déjà ça, adapter euh, nos caractéristiques, nos contraintes à euh, notre vie locale. Et c'est pareil quand je disais qu'on a euh, aussi cherché à prendre contact avec les ONG et tout ça par rapport au combat Montagne d'Or. En fait, sans, ils, ont, ils ont commencé le combat un an avant qu'on l'intègre. Sans notre revenue, en fait, ils n'étaient pas crédibles. Et l'État disait, oui, vous parlez, vous parlez, mais vous ne parlez pas au nom des Guyanais. Donc quand on a intégré le mouvement, c'était pour dire derrière, euh, non, nous sommes là, nous aussi, euh, en fait, l'écologie, si on veut, nous, nous, nous intéresse, mais il a fallu aussi qu'on fasse comprendre aux écologistes que, par exemple, là aujourd'hui, l'impact direct de la lutte pour un climat, euh, on va dire pas contre le climat, pour un climat meilleur euh, de la part de la France, c'est de mettre la Guyane sous cloche parce que euh, nous sommes euh, l'Amazonie et tout ça. Donc ça veut dire, comme je disais tout à l'heure, l'État est propriétaire de 90% du foncier. Toutes les zones sont naturelles. On ne peut rien faire. Quoi. Concrètement, ça, ça, ça veut dire que euh, même avoir un, un bout de terrain pour, avoir, euh, pour construire des écoles et tout ça, c'est compliqué. Il faut dealer avec l'État. Et, euh, et par contre, à l'inverse, on a euh, 300 000 hectares de, sur le territoire guyanais qui sont sous couvert de, de titres de recherche d'or donner aussi bien aux Américains qu'à tous les pays du monde, sauf aux Guyanais. On tue l'exploitation artisanale de l'or, qui, comme je disais, n'est pas, pas dommageable, on va dire, en soi, puisqu'elle est faite de façon raisonnée. Aujourd'hui, même les Amérindiens, face aux, aux représentants de locaux ou nationaux, disent, nous, euh, on peut vous expliquer comment, comment exploiter l'or sans faire du mal à la forêt et ce pas des choses qu'ils qu écoutent. Donc derrière, c'est pour ça qu'on veut décider localement de comment nous intégrer. Aujourd'hui, on reçoit des subventions européennes euh, alors qu'il y a des réglementations qui sont contre nos, nos propres euh, systèmes ou fonctionnements. Et rajouter surtout que nous avons des Garennes Perros qui pillent nos richesses, qui sont euh, cautionnées pour nous, cautionnées par l'État, parce qu'ils euh, pillent la, les richesses ils envoient des, des, des plombs harpies, soi-disant, et ils ramassent l'or et on ne sait pas où l'or passe. On ne sait pas ce qui, ce qui arrive. Ils nous montrent des fois des destructions de, de quoi, de tout ça. Mais pour nous, l'État est complice de, du vol, du pillage de, de nos ressources. Ça dit toute la raison. E que, e que mesmo, e que o movimento ecologista tem mesmo que ter cuidado para não propor soluções falsas que mantêm este modo de vida às custas da contínua exploração de pessoas e natureza pelo mundo todo. E isso passa-se muito, muito em todo o lado. Uh, um elemento que eu gostaria de vous soumettre, que é um dos paradoxos que revient à la questão da capacidade de abstração e de intellectualização das situações de opressão. L'un des endroits 
où la pensée s'est le plus développée, notamment en termes de, de lutte contre le colonialisme et d'émancipation politique, ça a peut-être été Paris dans les années 50 et 60. C'est-à-dire qu'à un moment, à la fin d'un empire colonial, émergeait dans une capitale euh, d'un grand empire euh, la possibilité, à partir des outils de cet empire, pour des individus, de Léopold Sgarsangor euh, jusqu'à euh, Aimé Césaire, en passant par Franz Fanon, mais aussi de façon internationale et pas du tout centrée sur la culture française, une pensée de l'émancipation. Et c est, c est, ce paradoxe apparent, en fait, a donné des outils à des générations suivantes pour, à partir de là, lutter pour leur propre liberté. On l'a vu aussi, ça allait au-delà des intellectuels, des avocats comme Jacques Vergès et autres, qui ont commencé, en fait, cette pensée décoloniale et de lutte contre la colonisation à partir du, de ce centre d'oppression. Aujourd'hui, je n'ai pas du tout l'impression que cela existe encore. Les centres aujourd'hui, par exemple, de consommation et d'élaboration de richesses euh, injustes comme peuvent l'être, par exemple, la Silicon Valley, ne sont pas des lieux de fabrication de pensée ou d'émancipation. Ils n'arrivent pas à rayonner et à donner des outils d'émancipation. Et donc la question que je me pose, c'est est-ce qu'il faut encore aspirer à une centralité de, de l'intellectualisation tout simplement parce que la, la question est simple. Une ville, par les échanges, permet à la pensée de se former. Le, comme des événements comme celui-ci nous permettent, je pense, à chacun d'entre nous de repartir avec des pensées nouvelles par la confrontation des expériences différentes. Une ville comme Paris, dans les années 50, permettait, par la circulation qu'elle organisait, même si c'était pour un, un système profondément injuste, de se faire former cette pensée qui, par la suite, a essaimé le monde. Comment est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, on réussit à former une pensée un moment où ces pôles, ces centralités n'existent plus ou ne semblent plus exister. Nous, je, je, je vais être... Nous, nos moyens d'action euh, qui sont utilisés par, en fait, on dit en, en créole, ensemble nous plie fort, ensemble nous qui arrivons. Donc ensemble on est plus fort, ensemble on va arriver. Et on fait ce gros travail, quand je parlais de son conscientisation, on va dans les quartiers et on, met, et on discute avec les gens du quartier. Euh, on fait ça dans tous les quartiers chauds de Guyane. Euh, là, par exemple, pour l'autonomie, c'est pareil. On, va dans les, on retourne dans les quartiers, du coup, donc on va assez régulièrement, pour parler du projet d'évolution statutaire. On essaye aussi euh, de, mener, de faire des, des, des tables de réflexion. Euh, on a été ceux, et c'est ce qui les dérange au travers de notre mouvement, c'est que euh, aussi bien on peut être assez, euh, ils disent, comme ils disent, violent, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, dans la rue, en train de mener des actions, qu'on mène des, 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 des tables rondes de discussion aussi, et euh, on, on fait beaucoup de rassemblements euh, de la population, euh, tout type, euh, parce que Guyanaise, ça ne veut rien dire, mais derrière, euh, voilà. Et y a, en fait, nous, nos actions de terrain, c'est ça, c'est de discuter avec la population, de créer des échanges. Et après, euh, où c'est plus difficile pour nous, c'est euh, de faire vivre tout ça en dehors de ces espaces de communication ensemble, de réunion. In other words, my question is, do we need centers still today No, I don't think we need censors, but I wanted to respond to um, what you asked about revolution, um, because I think, it, you know, a revolution means to turn something on its head, right? Um, and the way for a revolution to not only happen f over a few months or even years, but to actually be lasting is um, to change what is inside the head. I really do think that is very important to understand. And when it comes to um, globalization and localization, I think one thing that we need to get inside the heads of people um, is that, because at the moment we have a, a strong, either a strong push for globalization, um, uh, especially among the, the sort of corporate um, and elite classes, and then we have a strong anti-globalization movement which is happening Um, in, within feminism, for instance, within the left. And I think we need to be very clear what we, we're speaking about when we speak about globalization, because a lot of the, the language that has emerged since the 60s and with the EU and with neoliberalism neoliberal, um, that claims to be about globalization is actually about a kind of patriarchal, imperialist expansion. Um, and that is something that we ought to reject. But at the same time, the world is so interconnected now, not least because of the climate change that is taking place, 
that we do need to be, um, to be insistently global within our resistance movements because our struggles are so connected. Um, one of the things that I, I always say when I'm speaking with, with white feminists who are going to, um, to African countries or other parts of the world in, in the global south and not taking into account uh, colonial and imperialist structures is, you know, how do you think that the patriarchies in the Western world are empowered? It is through exploitation of countries in the global south and through the resources of both, both the natural resources and, and human resources, right? Um, so because our struggles are so interconnected, I do think that we need to, we need to make this distinction, which goes back to the idea of, um, of what revolution is. Um, it's, it's a change in mindset, first and foremost. Obrigado a todos. Talvez uma última palavra do, do Olivier. Oui, pour rejoindre ce qu'elle disait, euh, nous, par exemple, pour ma convocation, nous aurons donc euh, Kémy Seba, qui, que nous avons invité ce lundi pour nous soutenir dans, dans notre lutte. Et Kémy Seba, c'est euh, un personnage euh, important, un activiste euh, qui viendra nous défendre en tous les cas, éveiller les consciences euh, sur la révolution et la résistance. Muito obrigado.